uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this hybrid breakout session at the Climate Crossroads Summit. Um, this has been organized by the New Voices Program at the National Academies. We have, I'm not sure how many people are online, but it's so wonderful to see such a full room here. So please grab a seat. Um, our intent here is for this to be a conversational discussion. Um, so I'll do my best to kind of keep us on track. Um, for those of you who may not know, the New Voices in Science, Engineering, and Medicine program is a program of the National Academies that's designed to bring in new perspectives into the conversations that happen in this building and within the community. We're really excited to have this space at the Climate Crossroads Summit to hopefully bring some fresh insights and ideas on the topic of community engagement to the production of climate knowledge from experts that you might not have heard of otherwise. And we've really tried to be thoughtful to bring some of those uh, new voices here. And I, I hope you really enjoy the conversation. We have quite a breadth of topics that we'll be discussion, discussing today. So my name is Karma Sawyer. I am a member of the third cohort of the New Voices members. And this session was planned by many of my cohort members. I especially want to thank Matul Latar, New Voices cohort co-chair for cohort three, and an associate professor at the University of Southern California for his leadership in particular behind planning this session. Um, a lot of the invitations, the questions came from Matul and his thought leadership, and I'm very grateful for that partnership. So in today's session, the climate knowledge production, building trust through community engagement, we will explore some best practices for including regional knowledge and building trust for a more effective collaboration and community engagement in climate science and in developing climate solutions. Each of our four speakers will present for 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll follow up with a moderated conversation. And we'll of course have time for audience questions. I know there are a lot of you in the room, so we'll be sure to be able to prioritize that as much as we can. Um, for those of you that are here in the room with me, we have microphones available at the table. Um, I don't know, um, Allison Kamal, is there, are there microphones that we can pass around as well? Okay, so there's also a microphone to be passed around for those of you that um, are not sitting at the table. Um, and for the people that are joining us virtually, which stands at about 70 people right now, um, we have staff that will be sharing a link to the Slido platform and you can submit your questions there at any time during the session. So, okay, folks, let's go ahead and jump into it. Our first speaker is here in the room, Ms. Hadia Shiz Shirazi, did I do it correct? I'm sorry, Hadia. Um, Hadia is the manager in the Climate Aligned Industry Program at Rocky Mountain Institute, and she co-leads various equity and community engagement programs. She's also a contributing author on the New York City Panel on Climate Change, which helps inform strategies to protect vulnerable and low-income communities for growing climate risk. Um, we've asked Hadia to provide us with a data-based overview for disadvantaged communities and vulnerability in the climate space. Our intent is for Hadia to provide us with uh, ground, some laying the groundwork or a baseline to inform the rest of the discussions. So that's um, all for me from now. Hadia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karma. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Let me just move this a little bit closer. So my work, my day-to-day -day work is entirely about capacity building. And primarily because I focus on the highest emitting industrial sectors in the US and around the world, which means I'm looking at steel, shipping, aluminum, cement and concrete, um, waste methane, as well as looking at new technologies like clean hydrogen and direct air capture in the carbon management suite of technologies. A lot of my work is sitting with some of the largest project developers in the country and around the world and talking to them about what does it mean to do equitable community engagement? What does inclusive community engagement look like? And how do you include um, communities in ways that are meaningful and responsive to their needs? Because that leads to their ability to design better community benefit plans. I explain this to also illustrate a little bit that this is not just a capacity need for project developers, but that there are state and federal policymakers that are equally interested in understanding how better to work with disadvantaged communities. And now certainly there are regulators all around the country from the highest levels, whether it's FERC, or there are local public utility commission commissioners that are interested in understanding the same topics and the same issues. So why does this matter? 
in the US context, I'm going to start here for a moment. There's a definition that we have that became operational when we had the executive order that was passed by the Biden administration requiring that 40% of certain federal investments, so this is millions and billions of dollars, are going to be required under the, uh, under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act to flow to disadvantaged communities. And they've defined those communities as those that have been historically marginalized, overburdened by pollution and underinvestment in housing, transportation, water, wastewater, infrastructure, healthcare. In my area of work, I specifically focus on the most disadvantaged within the disadvantaged. Those that are traditionally and historically overlooked, they are underserved, and they are traditionally excluded from community engagement practices. So we'll go into that in a moment, but I wanted to, to explain that this spe special, special focus comes from my many years of working in climate adaptation, because I got my start on working in climate by looking at the fact that most countries did not have inclusive national disaster risk reduction policies, which meant that there were certain groups that were always going to be more disadvantaged than others in the event of a natural disaster. And most of the countries of the world, including the United States, are not prepared to respond. So for a quick, uh, I wanted to, to start here first, is that the reason that this matters is that more now, like now more than ever, there is a really general state of distrust, mistrust, and low trust of stakeholders that we have historically looked to for reliable, credible information. And that's scientists, medical scientists, journals, uh, military officials, and of course, elected officials. And the Pew Center had done this study about two years into COVID to be able to assess the state of public trust or distrust. And this is concerning doubly so, that when you think about the fact that one in three Americans are disadvantaged or they're living in disadvantaged communities, we're looking, talking about 27,200 communities around the country, where that's 109 million Americans that are living in disadvantaged communities. And the, the kind of focal point for me is the Gulf Coast, where nearly 50% of the population of five states is living in a disadvantaged community. Well, why does this really matter? So when I was talking about the groups that are most vulnerable, I want you to think of who is impacted first, who is impacted worst, and who is likely to be the very last to recover, if at all. And in my research and in my many years of working on climate adaptation, I found consistently to be true that young people, persons with disabilities, those that were displaced, indigenous and tribal peoples, and women and girls, to consistently show up as groups that are excluded from, from the design stage all the way to implementation, um, whether it's climate adaptation, whether it's now climate mitigation, whether it's sustainable development, this is a consistent trend. And I'll go into the numbers a little bit more in detail, but it's stunning if you think about the fact that we have 2.5 billion people that are young in the world. We have almost 1.3 billion people that have various disabilities, visible and invisible. We are looking at historic levels of displacement. Over 117 million people um, that we can count are displaced at the moment. And we have millions and millions of women and girls living in multidimensional poverty. And we have over 476 million indigenous people around the world that are also facing exclusion in different ways. All of these threats that they face become amplified by what you can see um, my right hand side, um, which is a second list of risk or threat multipliers, essentially. So poverty, racial and ethnic or my other minority status, accessibility barriers, and this is beyond basic ADA compliance, which is a privilege and an incredible right that is afforded in the United States and is certainly not true around the world. Differences in education attainment and exclusion from traditional socioeconomic um, mainstream activities like banking, like housing, the fact that there are large numbers of people around the world that cannot participate in democratic processes. And then resource scarcity, which is, which is worsened by things like regional and local conflict. In a very young world, one in six children in the US live in poverty, and one in six live in extreme poverty globally. In terms of tribal and indigenous people, along with those living in rural communities in the US, in the United States, seven out of 10 are without access because they're living in broadband deserts. We have one in four people who are disabled in the United States, 
one in five living with serious disabilities around the world. And that number has increased, obviously, since the COVID-19 pandemic, plunging more and more people into long-term COVID symptoms. Women and girls around the world continue to be among the first that are impacted and the last if ever to recover. And the reason that this is particularly important to think about is that all of the groups that I've listed, they are doubly, triply impacted when they, they have refugee status. And whether they're internally displaced or they are climate migrants or they are conflict migrants, that is exacerbated. A simple example is that Pakistan hosts one of the largest numbers of Afghan refugees historically. All of those refugees then became climate refugees when the 2022 floods hit. So that's the second or third displacement, second or third disaster for many of millions of people around the world. Many of whom are actually now being um, placed into refugee camps that are also cited inappropriately. So for instance, New York City had selected a site that was flood prone. They were advised that it was flood prone. They proceeded anyway. And of course, after it's almost half a million dollars were spent, we had a flooding incident and then they had to move the site. And I could go into so many examples, but I only have 10 minutes. And so I will keep this really quick. The reason I'm painting this picture will become a little bit clearer in a moment. I hope that we're looking, and, and then the, the other group that I wanted to point out specifically are the elderly. We are looking at almost a doubling of the number of people that are going to be 65 and over um, by 2050. And certainly this photograph, I have been haunted by it from the moment that I first saw it. During Hurricane Harvey, there were this group of people that were living in this um, assisted care facility were trapped and not evacuated till this photo went viral. I mean, it's unimaginable that people that are just sitting there in water that's like waist deep, unable to be evacuated. The reason that I highlight this is that it's quite obvious. Let's go back to this for a second. It's quite obvious when I looked at Nash, when I just look at New York City's like emergency evacuation plans that the plans are designed by people that have never ever had to be in these positions. They are not members traditionally of any of these groups because if a person has not lived in a basement apartment, they would not know that it is one of the first places to flood. And therefore a text message advising people to shelter in place is essentially committing them to a watery get grave. Um, similarly, we don't have women and girls included in all stages of disaster risk recovery planning in any country of the world. In fact, many of these tribunals are entirely military in certain countries, or they're very largely male. And so when we exclude significant numbers of highly vulnerable people from planning and um, design activities that are life-saving, we are condemning them to the opposite of, of, of being able to survive. The last two things that I wanted to highlight is in the US context, and so much of my work right, is talking about things like green hydrogen and nuclear and offshore wind and renewables. It is extremely hard to think about knocking on a door or, or picking up the phone and, and calling somebody that is dealing with this level of energy poverty and insecurity, where they are unable to pay their utility bills because they're making choices between being able to buy food, buy medication, or keep the lights on. For those that are elderly or those that have healthcare needs that require the use of electricity, for instance, an oxygen machine, not having utility debt equals death. We have an enormous amount of utility debt in this country. We have even worse levels of water utility debt in this country. And so when we take, for my work in particular, this becomes really important because when we're talking about technologies that are needed, like so any technology that involves producing green electrons, um, is going to, uh, green hydrogen, for instance, which is based on the fact that we need green electrons, it also requires water. We are going through a historic mega drought in this country. There are entire towns and municipalities that are losing their status because they are, um, people are actually not able to pay their mortgage because the cost of getting a water tanker delivery is higher than their mortgage. And so there are people in Arizona that are just abandoning their homes. Um, so I share all of this why. What does it mean? There are these incidents from around the country, from around the world. If I can say it in, an, in a nutshell, it's that community engagement is hyper-local. So the context of where we're working, who we're working with, what that community has gone through will always be incredibly, incredibly important for us to be effective. So in my work, whether it's climate mitigation with some of the biggest developers for offshore wind, for renewables, for clean carbon and hydrogen technologies, or if it's looking at adaptation on the national as well as the international level, 
these are best practices that over and over and over have been found to be true. And I know this now because the work that I do heavily focuses on case studies, and that's essentially doing an autopsy of a project after the fact to see what went wrong, what went well, and over and over these things are true. Engaging communities early and often, offering just and equitable compensation for their time, their learned experience and expertise, including them in participatory governance structures, whether that looks like a task force, an advisory body, it looks like community monitoring, community evaluation, ensuring that there's transparency and accountability from the beginning to the end. That includes for a project, for instance, the design all the way to decommissioning. And then of course, thinking about accessibility broadly. There are 7,000 languages, over 7,000 languages spoken in the world, 4,000 alone by indigenous peoples. We could probably take a guess how many languages are important notifications translated into right here in the United States. So I think that I would love, I would encourage you to ask more questions um, if, if you have specific questions, but these are the gold standards and best practices because over and over again, we have found that when one of these is missing, community engagement is not two-way, it is not inclusive, it is not responsive, and therefore it is not effective. And so broadly, when we think about communicating climate science, we think about communicating climate adaptation or mitigation strategies, this is sort of how we have to design the process from the very beginning to be able to be effective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hadia. That was a wonderful way to start off this panel. Very insightful. Our, our next speaker, Ms. Tara Hauska, who is joining us virtually from Minnesota, is going to continue to build upon Hadia's presentation. Ms. Huska is a tribal attorney and an environmental and indigenous rights advocate. She is also the founder of the Jin U Collective, an indigenous women two spirit led frontline resistance to defend the sacred and live in balance. Tara has spoken to scientists and engineers many times about community engagement, and she will provide us with best practices and techniques that can inform all of our work in the science and engineering community and as researchers. And I hope you all are listening with your ears wide open to what she has to share. Tara, the floor is yours. Hey, Buju, and good morning, I guess, sort of close to the afternoon for you guys. Um, uh, my name is Tara Hauska. I'm Bear Clan from Kuching First Nation, which is actually where I'm calling you from. Um, what's now the border of Minnesota and Ontario. Um, yeah, I have I have spent a fair amount of time talking with scientists and engineers and folks in the climate space uh, in this last decade plus of engaging in this work to try to protect and save our only home. Um, and our children's right to have a future, quite honestly, I think is what we're really looking at. Um, I can talk some about what was, I guess, it was just mostly covered a lot of the basic practices. I mean, I think, you know, there's plenty to be said about some of the bad things that have happened over time, right? There are reasons that so many of these communities distrust the science and academic community. Um, you know, from everything to biopiracy and theft of indigenous knowledge um, to conducting studies without full transparency, like around some of the um, issues of genetic testing and DNA collection, I know that have occurred with indigenous populations, uh, some of whom I've worked with when I was a full-time practicing lawyer um, based in DC. But I think like it, it seems valuable to uh, spend some time at least talking about um, what it's looked like for me as a community advocate to be in this space and to see the science community show up in various capacities and uh, some of the places I think that really are needed and helpful in this fight, honestly, for our survival as a species. Um, and I think as I've seen more and more scientists over the years stepping up into organizing spaces, into taking nonviolent direct action, into, you know, trying to push 
the industry and the political world into a direction that actually respects and acknowledges the crisis that we are in. Um, you know, I, I hope to see more of that, quite honestly, to see a stepping up of uh, a community that, yeah, I mean, I saw that initial slide that there is distrust. And I think that that's a reflection more of the society than anything else. I mean, like we've just had a presidential candidate get shot at and half the country is saying it was a hoax, right? I mean, I think we have been pushed so far into what is the truth and what is reality. I mean, you've got folks who are denying climate crisis and denying climate change as the pavement is melting, right? Like, I, I think that we're in a place where, yeah, I, I don't know that public trust is, is something that's going to be restored very easily. Um, but I do think there are many folks who are very interested in our future and very interested in saving these little guys that are <laughs> now sitting on the Zoom with us. Um, this is Josephine. Um, and I think the science community in particular has, I would say, more public trust for sure than like the journalistic community or the politicians or the folks who are, you know, <laughs> selling uh confusion and chaos so readily um and so that means that i you know when scientists are stepping up into those spaces and truly in a place of not creating this separate barrier of you know i'm just going to study the data and i'm going to collect the data and i'm going to present it well we've had the icc group screaming for years now and now we're talking about climate boiling right like at some point, there has to be something where the words are not enough, the statistics are not enough, the data is not enough. I recognize there are incredible, brilliant minds that are working on climate mitigation and climate adaptation. I'm on the other side of it where I'm working on defense, right, of, of what remains. Um, and I'll readily and always citing that 80% of what's left of Earth's biodiversity is in indigenous hands that wasn't by accident that wasn't by you know solar panels or wind turbines that was by uh sustainability practices and long-standing depth of relationship with earth right like those are not concepts i think that find their way into uh these spaces very often and if they are they're kind of more relegated to i would say like a more romantic approach or it's kind of mind for any sort of data um, or any sort of um, hard hitting policy, you know, as we understand it, I, I, as I see it, I don't think those hard hitting policies are really working. Our, our world's leaders are refusing to listen to us, um, us being the collective group of folks who are terrified of what is coming, right? Of this being the coldest summer of our lifetimes right like it's just going to get hotter and hotter and hotter and we know that um you know this the climate migration is going to become worse the uh normalization of gross human rights violations i think is on the world stage right now we we are all seeing that in real time um and so i guess you know my my hope for for this community is yeah i mean in the hyper local situations you know i can't count on the number of times that i've had scientists ask you know how can we help when we're in the middle of fighting a pipeline or some massive mine to probably build those solar panels that will destroy irrevocably the ecosystem that remains here um and we say things like we need and a really clear public health information of our communities which are oftentimes not in you know in the the approval of the most recent pipeline project i fought there was a paragraph dedicated to indigenous peoples and the impact that it would have to us. You know, that is absolutely a complete, <laughs> you know, I think uh, example of the failures of the regulatory system and also the science community and of the local community to come together to recognize what this actually means for people. Um, and not just us, but everybody downstream, right? Like the billions of folks who depend on the watershed of North America to exist. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, I think things like when we ask for reporting information, when we ask for ways that, you know, academic institutions in particular can use uh, their more not industry driven, although I guess that is oftentimes still the case with a lot of the big grants, but that they can use their platforms and help us and their resources to create reporting mechanisms to help us as we're trying to defend our territories. Um, I think there's also a lot to be said for scientists stepping out into the streets with us, for scientists to step out into the woods with us in a way that, as I've found over the years, is one of the most uh, impactful ways to push back against uh, climate brutality. You know, I mean, I think that's what we're really seeing is the eating up of what remains um, and recognizing that you know, in the IRA, I know that was mentioned too. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of block grants and community investment that's included in that package that was pushed by some really brilliant folks who I admire and respect, but there is also an incredible investment into the mining industry, into extraction, into uh, essentially just moving over the practices that have been in place to a different form of um, resource being sought. And where do all those resources sit? I mean, it's upwards of 80, 90% of most of these precious minerals um, in the U.S. are located next to an Indian reservation or right on it. And uh, where the, the folks who experience climate change first and worse as being so close to the earth in so many ways. Um, and so I guess I would say to all of you in your work to think about you know, not just the the broad range, but also to always remember that this comes with the the costs do matter, and it's not just a question of morality. And as I see it, I mean, there is incredible wisdom and uh, brilliance in adaptation, but there is also incredible wisdom and brilliance in protecting what's also still here while we still have it. Um, and I think I will leave it with that and appreciate the time and space. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, Tara. Um, our next speaker is Professor Ari Saikawa, who is a professor of environmental sciences at Emory University. Her research interests are focused on quantifying the source and magnitude of various emissions linked to air pollution and climate change, as well as the impacts on these emissions on humans and society. Um, Ari is also a member of New Voices. Uh, she's actually one of our co-chairs, so I'm thrilled to have her here representing the program alongside me. Um, she's going to tell you a compelling story about how her research has engaged communities in Atlanta and have changed the um, conditions that they live in. So Ari, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Kama. And thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And I would also like to thank Alison, Como, and Rose um, for helping with this session. It's a new voices session. It's so great to see so many people. Um, I guess there is potentially <laughs> these chairs that could be used if the people um, that are standing will like the chair, but it's so great to um, have everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the story where I came to be here. Uh, as mentioned, um, I, I mainly work on emissions. So I've been very interested in different types of emissions and agricultural sector is one of them. I think it's fascinating. Um, it's a source of um, greenhouse gas emissions, but also air pollutant emissions. It has impacts on human health, the economy, and I was mainly modeling and doing some field measurements. And we realized that this is also related to the food system. And as you see here, there are a lot of food deserts in the US. Um, some people call it food apartheid now. If you don't have a car and if you're not close to the supermarket, then you don't get to have fresh produce. So we started to look into that a little bit, and there were a lot of community gardens um, happening in Atlanta, even before COVID. This is, um, it's saying about 300, um, that was around 2016. And the city was also trying to have what's called urban agriculture, and they coined the term Atlanta, Atlanta and agriculture together. 
it's a great initiative, um, you know, for people that don't have the fresh produce, you do want to have some urban gardening or urban farming. And so they were trying to lease the land um, so that farmers can come in and grow food. The problem was that there is a potential soil contamination. It's an urban area and we've seen in many cities that happen. And so we wanted to just make sure that the soil was actually safe for gardening. And so my lab mates, especially my PhD student then, went to um, do the testing in these lots that were supposed to be leased. And in one of the lots, it just looks like an ordinary uh, empty lot. We found a uh, lead level that was over then the EPA regional screening level. It was 430.9 ppm parts per million milligrams per kilogram of soil. So we care about, do we care about lead before? Not really. We were mainly focused on air pollution, but because we found it, um, we, we were very concerned, mainly because of the health impacts for the children. And as many of you are here, there is so much health impact for the kids. And it impacts their neurodevelopment. It affects the signaling. And what is, I think, very important is how it affects people's IQ. And so the top is the distribution of IQ scores in US children. Six million are gifted and six million with intellectual disability. If you are exposed to lead, this normal distribution shifts to the left. And so we have so many more people with intellectual disability. And I think we have to ask here, who are the people that are going to be impacted? This normal distribution does not affect people equally. And so the people that are already impacted from climate you know, disasters that we, we heard about and all the other environmental exposures, those are the people also impacted by this lead contamination. And so where we found was an underserved community and we uh, were very fortunate to be matched with a community-based organization that was working on urban farming, urban gardening. And so we targeted this historic West Side neighborhood, low income, primarily, primarily black neighborhood. And we created some simple schematics so that community members could go and actually measure themselves. The community leaders helped us create this and we were able to showcase how to collect the samples together. And we um, were able to collect 11 um, well, samples from 11 sites, 11 residential sites and samples from five agricultural sites using this rigorous scientific method collected by together with us and the residents over there. And we compare that to the background sites. And this is what I'm showing in this figure. Out of the 11 sites, three of them were higher than, than EPA screening level. Right now it got lower to 200 ppm. And we were concerned that the, they were so high. We thought that that was not very normal. Some people told us it was, but we wanted to figure out. And the community leaders were very concerned that there were the three out of the 11 sites had high lead levels. And so then they went out to spread the word. And a lot of the people actually brought their soil samples to an event. And one of the community members brought these rock pieces and asked us, is it possible that these are the source of contamination? And they turned out to be slag, uh, waste material coming from smelting. And because those were used as fuel material in the neighborhood, this was causing a lot of lead issues. So because of the community input, we were able to put together a report to the EPA and the EPA started the investigation. We started off with 60 lots in the beginning. Uh, it quickly spread to this purple, 300 lots. And then it spread to over a thousand lots. That was green. And then now it's 2097 lots in the pink. So it's now a super fun site and it recently got listed as a national priorities list. But then what happens to the people that are just below the level? When we were talking to people, there were uh, homeowners that did not meet the standard for cleaning up. And what they asked us was, is it possible for you, for us, to do some phytoremediation work? Are the plants uh, going to be able to beautify the land and also clean up? Um, and so we tested some of the plants that were 
considered effective, um, effective, sorry, for cleaning up. And this was done in the greenhouse. We collected the soil from the contaminated areas. And we also did that in the garden. They really cared that this would be able to not just clean up, but also beautify the area. They wanted to make them pretty. They were very um, disheartened that there was so much lead. That was where they were living. And we think that this has happened um, in 1950s or 50s, 50s or 60s, much long time ago. And the neighborhood members did not know that. And they also asked us, how is it related to where they live and environmental justice? And we found out that the areas where we found this lead issue is, I've already mentioned, the low income area. And this is the picture of Atlanta. It's very clear. The color um, of the map is the median household income level. So on the more yellow, the color, the lower the median household income, and the more blue, um, it's higher income. But what surprised us was that not everybody is actually tested for blood lead levels. The bubbles are those kids that are tested for blood lead levels. And at that time, only about 25% at most were tested. And I think we really need the universal testing. And the color of the bubble is the proportion of the children that are tested high. Um, at that time, it was five micrograms. The deciliter was considered as a threshold. It's got lower to 3.5 now, but in, in one zip code, 13% of the children had more than five micrograms of deciliter of lead. So that also led us to start a new project. We heard that there is no free testing for blood lead available. And we wanted to be able to um, provide that. And we also were concerned that there might be other um, contaminants that they were exposed to. So this is um, started off as Community Engaged Children's Health Study, CCHS. And we also heard that there, there needs more uh, raising awareness. People needed to know. And a lot of people wanted to also test their soil, but they just wanted to screen, not test rigorously. And so then we also started doing some soil testing. We call it soil shock sometimes um, so that people can bring in their soil samples and we can test and tell the results right away. Some people wanted um, free lead screening. So we also did that at the church um, as well. But what it has led us um, from agriculture now to looking into homes for different contaminants. We are also finding that there are let it paint in various areas in homes and the people are not aware of it. Also, we sometimes find mold issues in the neighborhood, in the community. So she was one of the first participants for the CCHS and she's holding the, the flyer for our study. But when we went to her home, she was having so much mold issues. So I think it's just so important community, uh, sorry, climate change is so linked to everything. They were initially wanting to do urban gardening because they wanted to have their fresh produce. And they were so into composting and it would be such a great solution. But there are also other issues if we don't take those into account. And I'm just, um, I, I think we really need to be mindful of all the issues that these neighborhoods, the community members are exposed to. So in summary, um, I think soil lead contamination is not really talked about, but that is really common. And because of the community engaged work, we were able to find the slug dump in this neighborhood. Um, and I told you that it is listed as a um, national priorities list. But for me, working with communities, I was never trained as a community scientist. I was just a modeler at first. Um, but I think there are ways that scientists can really learn from the community members. And I hope my story is inspiring to those that were not necessarily trained, were not planning to do it, but things come to you and there are ways that we can always be engaged. And I think there is so much lack of awareness that scientists can work on. And um, there's just multiple complex issues that we also need to think about other than what we usually work on. So I've been talking all the time, but I have more than 50 people in my lab. So this is a huge uh, effort by the village. Uh, and this is all the members of my lab that work on the CCHS project. And obviously uh, there are some past members that have been working on this. This has been going on since 2016. 
um, Sam Peters was the one uh, that was really instrumental. He started it and he left. And I was like, what are you leaving me with? This is <laughs> such a huge project that he left me with. But uh, I really do also want to thank all my collaborators. Um, these are the collaborators at Emory and um, mainly the community partners. These community partners have really taught me so much and um, I, I really thank them for their insights and for giving me different questions to think about and uh, obviously the funding as well. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ari, for this amazing story. So our last speaker is joining us virtually from Colorado. Uh, Dr. Roderick Jackson is the Laboratory Program Manager for Buildings Research at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. He sets a strategic agenda for NREL's building portfolio, and he works closely with the U.S. Department of Energy's Building Technologies Office to improve the resilience, the comfort, and the energy efficiency of buildings in all communities. Uh, we've asked Roderick to join us as the engineer on the panel. He'll be discussing how to engage and partner with communities when you're developing and deploying new clean energy technologies. Roderick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Carmen. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity to join this panel. This is, uh, it's been exciting thus far and I look forward to the continued conversation that we'll have. Um, so next slide. So as I start, you know, as we talk about the clean energy transition and Karma articulated that some of the work that we do is really with regards to how do we, what are the mitigation strategies along the lines of the clean, uh, transitioning to a cleaner economy? Uh, and what, and historically, a lot of the work has been on the generation perspective of how do we ensure that we transition uh, to a cleaner generation? You can see here in the picture, you have uh, two sources of clean energy generation, both the sun and the wind. However, as we really move forward, and one of the ways to ensure that this solution is, is it actually we achieve our goal as we and also achieve it in a manner that is that prioritizes people, we have to take a step back. The next slide. And this is some of the work that we're doing now and really trying to focus on what does it mean to not take a purely technocentric perspective, but to take a step back and say, what well, is a people-centric perspective of a clean energy future? And that's where, when we look at the question of community engagement, it starts to become more central to how we do our work. Because if you have a very technocentric perspective, as the, the, the first uh, speaker articulated, that technocentric perspective actually creates an environment where those communities who are first and worst impact as uh, the first speaker articulated become marginalized in some of their approaches because we are focusing on the technology and not necessarily appreciating or understanding the impact in different communities where the impact is super hyper localized and this is where uh, focusing on or asking the questions through community engagement allows us to better understand and ensure that our research um, meets all communities. Uh, why are we doing this? Who does it benefit? What is the cost and where does it work? Where does it not work? These are some of the questions. These are some of the renewed questions that we are bringing to the work to ensure that the solutions are applicable to all. Next slide. Next slide, maybe this is a transition slide, but um, and so one of the things that was the, the I think that one of the things that we as an organization, and this is something that I, I speak on whenever I speak to anyone is, is as a science and technology science and technology community, it's our responsibility to ensure that the solutions we provide are credible and applicable to all communities. And so this is because I think a lot of times we think about, well, this is this is equitable. This is this equity is, is really focusing on this is someone else's job and not really the scientist and engineer. Carmen said I get to be the engineer on the panel. I'm most of the time I consider myself a recovering engineer, but for this case I could be the engineer. But as scientists who are developing at no matter what stage or what place in the TRL technology readiness level spectrum you're in, you really have to ensure that we understand the needs for every community. Because as as as, as also um, articulated earlier, you know, if you have certain vulnerabilities, sometimes those vulnerabilities can be amplified by different different scenarios or situations. And I would and I would posit that an, an additional amplifier could be the miss the applicability of the solution for that community. If a solution was designed with a community in a community in mind that had a different set of constraints, different set of conditions, different set of environmental or infrastructure um, baselines, and the solution that the clean energy solution isn't 
was didn't take those in consideration, that could be an actual amplifier to the vulnerability that those communities actually have. And so as a science and technology community, we it was incumbent upon us to partner with the community so that we both understand those needs and we can make sure we can ensure that those those needs as well as the the conditions in which the solutions will operate are understood and designed into the solutions that we develop. Next slide. So now I wanted to just talk about some approaches that a couple projects or a couple of uh, approaches that we've taken. This is um, an example. These are some communities or some ways or some um, partners that we have engaged with in order to do community engagement because as we know, these conversations are, are becoming more prevalent. They're becoming more prevalent because historically we haven't done this. And so you can't, so it, just the fact as we uh, articulated by many, it takes time and to build a level of trust to have effective community engagement. So to presume that we as scientists will be able to just go into communities and say, hey, I'm I'm a scientist. I'm here to help. Or I, you know, here I am. Let's let's get to work. Doesn't necessarily work as effectively. So what we've been doing is we've been finding different partners, different partners across the country, and different um, that have served different roles with communities that allow us to 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 begin to have those relationships where trust has already been built over time that could be leveraged in order to make sure that in order to help foster the type of um, engagement and cross collaborative. Um, research that will uh, in co-production of research i would say that allows us to, to have the most effective outcomes and these are just some of the organizations there are many but this is the first step is we just to not go in and say that we can do it but it's partner with communities and organizations who have already been there next slide and, and when you find this and when you do this these are some of this is an example like i said there are many i just wanted to pick a couple examples to, to kind of articulate on this panel is when you do that you start hearing from the community and when you hear from the community in the community's voice, you, you start it, they, it may be, it starts to elucidate things that we may not typically are, un, appreciate. And some of the here is some, and I can just go through some, some of these, not to speak to many, is that too many of the models focus on co cost optimization and they fail to factor in the climate impacts and assign a value to carbon. Or they say, well, how are we gonna pay for all this stuff? Or we feel that this, this interaction that we're having uh, can be transactional. How do we have this more two-way? What does the presence look like? And how do we have realism to the data? We the data is articulated in the manner that we historically articulated to a different community. And now that we're having this community engagement, how do we make it real to the community? And then in underserved communities, commercial buildings are mainly apartment com complex and small business. All of these are the voices from the community that these are non-traditional data points per se, how we as a research uh, community have, have typically um approach that work, but having this context, data without context provides, it, it provides an opportunity to, to misunderstand uh, or miss or develop solutions that are inappropriate for the community. But having this type of contextualization of the research and the data that we're, the data that we're collecting allows us to have better outcomes. Next slide. And so this is, and, and yeah, this is, a final example that I wanted to give, but this is one where really taking that to the to the next level of saying, okay, we have these approaches where we um, can, um, where we take different policies or we develop different carb efficiency to decarbonization policies, but we, what are the methods and the, um, the, the, the method that, ne the methods and metrics that we use to be able to understand what buildings are, buildings are most important. And typically these are very data centric. These are very technical search. These may be energy use intensity data or things like that. But in this project, this is an example where we actually said, well, let's go into the community. Let's go into the community, work with the community to understand what's important to you. You know, we can see a building. We have, we can look at a building, a, a map. You can map out the energy use intensity across the building and say, okay, these are the building hotspots, quote unquote. But when we start to talk to building owners, we tenants and others to say, well, what are the, what are the buildings that are most important to you? How should what what are the how do these buildings how does the community interact with these different buildings and we start to get answers that some are aligned with maybe energy use intensity but some are not and then as we also layer on and, and particularly as, with regards to the panel's conversation around climate change the need for adaptation and the need for resilience what happens with resilience as resilience hubs are needed where do where do communities and how do the communities interact with their buildings and their and the and the building infrastructure 
when these needs for when the need for resilience hub presents itself. And these are some of the things that we've been doing. And we, we started the pilot project in a very diverse community uh, in Colorado, Aurora, Colorado, as 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 an initial step and to inform some of our building um some of the approaches that we're taking in building performance or developing building performance standards to be able to inform where it's more people centric, where it's not purely or not solely focused on just the energy, but it's allowing the energy to be coupled with and layered with some of the really the specific needs of the community. Next slide. Here, it, it, and what this allows is now we can look at data analysis and it's not purely just con data content, but it's allowing us to contextualize that data with information from the community so we can ensure that the outcomes are more equitable. And this is this the way we do this. It, it takes in-person, right? It takes in-person meetings, going to the community. We have the number of meetings that we that we we did and then on the previous slide where we actually had we actually were we had um participated in events, in rail signs, in rail booths, who is in rail, just to kind of take some of that historical um disconnect and, and kind of where it's now more of a connection to say we're here in the community, we're actually fairly local, and how can we better understand what your needs are and what are the communities? How how do you engage with the buildings and how can we best ensure that when we do different policies or we develop um, solutions, they are solutions that where the benefits flow directly and most effectively to the needs of the community. Next slide. And some of the lessons learned that we can now that we've already, that we started to glean and we'll be moving forward in, in, in other projects is how can we make sure that these are, um, we, we have our high level goals, but now we can start to tie those to the needs of the research of the of the, um, of the community. Because the challenges that we find, a lot of the times as we develop solutions, we develop research um, research strategies, we have certain timelines, that, but you can't, trust can't be built without time. And so now how do we often, how do we engage the community in such a way that we can build in the appropriate timelines and develop solutions that affect, that develop solutions or not necessarily a solution, but include in the solution the timelines are appropriate to have community engagement. And now we can look at, okay, once we have that community engagement, we bring it back to the research. We now can say, okay, well, how does this provide context to the data? Because data without that context or content without context doesn't allow us to really fully appreciate what the solution is. And now we have better understand the why. Because now if you have researchers who are being cross-trained with engaging the community, they can understand how these are the specific outcomes and how these outcomes affect the needs of the community. And if these are misaligned with the solutions that the communities need, then the, the expected outcome will be also be misaligned with the expectations of the researcher. And it really now helps us to really to better achieve that goal that we uh, initially set forward to do in partnership with the community. And then lastly, it allows us to prioritize based upon how the community feels, not based on our expectation or our thoughts of what the community needs, but it allows us to better understand what the community wants so we have that co, uh, that participatory research that's developed together. Next slide. Thank you. Okay, folks, so I do have a list of questions that have put together with the co-organizers. For, for those of you that are joining us virtually, I don't know if you, we have a very full room. So I wanna be sure that we leave plenty of time for Q&A for all of you. So I'll start off with one or two questions. We have about 35 minutes, but I will absolutely give lots of time for the folks in the room. Um, so start getting your wheels turning about what you would like to ask our speakers. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask, not directed towards any one of the panelists in particular, um, is that the performance of scientists and engineers, um, it's often measured in terms of intellectual output or property. So techniques or tools that are developed or data that's generated. Um, the emphasis on that can often be viewed as an extractive practice. It's kind of the Western way of doing research that doesn't always translate. So I'd love to get thoughts on how we, uh, the science and engineering community, can ensure that the collective local knowledge and that non-traditional data 
is appropriately acknowledged and, and compensated. And when I say compensated, I'm really thinking along the lines of the research and implementation funding that can reflect the importance of that local on the ground knowledge so that we can build it into our community in kind of a more holistic way. So does anyone want to, to jump in and react to that, that question? I can start, I guess, in some of the conversations that we've had internally. Um, it, 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 there are multiple phases, there are multiple approaches, and some, sometimes it may include, um, because you know, the, having a spectrum per se of research outcomes, whereas maybe there is a traditional pathway of a journal article or some type of academic article to continue to advance the science, but then also including in the budget, including in the timelines, an appropriate solution, an appropriate communication that is more meaningful to the community. We've seen this in some of our solo work that this, the community would say, well, we don't really, this, this isn't really helpful for us. And so what is a, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a two page white paper in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a language that is, that is developed or uh, the outline or the approach is developed in, co in combination with the community. So that's a way that to maybe have that kind of um, spectrum. And then also as far as um, additional intellectual property intellectual approaches is, how do you do that? What are the effective ways? That's, an, that's actually an advancement science to say, how do we effectively communicate in order so, in a way such that we maximize the understanding? Because a lot of times in, in solutions development, the, um, the reason solutions don't work is because people are not understanding the problem at the same level. They don't appreciate that the problem, they're looking at an elephant and looking at different parts of it. And so being able to effectively communicate our outcomes with the community allows us to better ensure that they are actually appropriate. Go ahead, Ari. Okay, yeah, thank you. So um, it was very, it was a learning curve for me to find out that to include community members uh, on, as an author on the journal article is such a challenge. Like that's not what they're interested in. And then there's so many things that you have to do to have them as the author. And so that really made me think what's the potential system change that we can have so that it's easier for them to be authors if that they're interested, but also what would be the best way to showcase. So I think that's something that I'm very interested in. They, they tell us that they want to be able to have the data that's easy to understand. And sometimes as scientists, we, can, we have to wait until that's published. So there's a lot of dilemma and how can we work it out? I think that's very important. But also what we are trying to do now is to include their lived experience in the data um, showcase so that we have the map uh, where we talk to the community members and try to understand their um, cumulative risk index for, the, for climate change as we prepare for climate change. And we've got the data source from environmental, social, economic, and health and we put them together and not just putting them together, we ask them what, do, what they think is most important in terms of their lived experience. What should we be weighing if we were to th think about the cumulative risk index? And that kind of um, dialogue has really helped us understand better. And I hope that that's going to become a better practice for them as well as just um, you know, giving them the compensation, et cetera, is very important. But I think there are other things that structural change that's really needed too. All right, unless uh, Tara or Heidi, you wanna jump in, I'm gonna go ahead to another question in the interest of time. Um, so the next question I had was, you know, a lot of community engagement practices, they're top-down efforts and they're understandably met with local resistance during implementation. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on what effective ways you might have encountered to gather community input early in the process. We all said early is important, but what does it really look like? How do we actually do that engagement effectively? Adia? Thank you, Kamet. So this is one of my favorite questions. And um, it's my favorite question because I'm asked this question quite frequently by a lot of project developers where they say, so like, when is the right time? Like how early is too early or what is the right time? And the interesting thing is that the reality is for most people, they find out that a project is being developed or a technology is now coming to their neighborhood when the boulders show up outside, right? So if, we if I were to start this sort of um, start by saying that 
the process of engaging the community starts at the inception of the idea that whether or not they even want to host this project or this technology or they're even interested in engaging and that can be certainly uncomfortable for certain developers that are thinking of like oh well if i were to announce that i'm planning to um build this project the price of land might go up or the demands might go up or they might you know the, the community might want xyz and they're all there are very many reasons to not want to be inclusive early and to be transparent but almost every single time that will result in a failure to engage and it will now what we're seeing is a result the results are permitting and citing denials and project permanently being projects being cancelled or delayed um the second that i would like to add very to this is is this local context every community is different in some communities the discussions happen in barber shops and others they happen in churches in yet others they happen in kit at kitchen tables or in playgrounds and so understanding the local context is extremely powerful and important and understanding who are the influencers and who holds the power to sway and influence in that particular community is really important because they are the trusted messengers right they are the credible messengers for this um for for, for having these dialogues um, related to that is invariably I have found that public hearings to discuss new projects, to discuss new technologies, to discuss even like this fact that if you want to do a research project, they're convened at times which is like the middle of the workday whether people are day laborers, whether they're caregivers, whether they're just a person that doesn't don't have the luxury of taking two hours off to attend a meeting or traveling to Washington DC to participate in a public proceeding. Um, these are all things that factor into that. And then you add into the fact stipend and the compensation bit. So I've seen this a lot with certainly when we look at um, grant proposals and we, when we, we've been having these conversations about how what does a just compensation look like so there again there are little prongs to this the first is even the fact that what is it is it an hourly rate are we compensating people per hour of their time how are they going to get there is there a transit desert um do they do they need to be compensated for gas do, is there a bus is there a shuttle um Will there be childcare or elder care costs that need to be factored in? And then the, the most interesting part is I have been a grant, I have been an expert merit reviewer for the Department of Energy. So I've seen and evaluated grant proposals. And the choices of where cash is king versus a gift card is being issued. Like all of these things really matter in the sense of like how are we building in the community as equal co-contributors to this knowledge? And how are we respecting their time and their lived, the expertise of their lived experience? And the last bit, which I really am really going to touch on because I think Tara is really truly the right person and the person that I would like to, um, you know, would love to hear from, from, from her about this is that a lot of times a projects that involve tribal and indigenous engagement, they've, it has to be really clear that this is a government to government consultation, that, that this is engagement with a sovereign and sovereign nation and so there is an invitation to con consult and that is a request for a consultation and there is a due process and respect that is accorded that needs to be met um it's very different because it's not like another stakeholder convening they're not it's not having a meeting with a stakeholder group and so there are all these like nuances that flow into that design of creating a process that is not top down the last bit, which is sometimes truly surprising, is where I've asked, you know, developers and I said, so when you talk to the community, what did they tell you? What do they like? Do they like public hearings? Do they like focus groups? And it's a kind of a surprise because they've not thought about doing that. And that applies to research as well. Asking, so for, for instance, it's like, would you like a phone call or would you like me to send you a text message? makes it easier right and so asking people of how they would like to be engaged the frequency with which they would like to be engaged all of that is part of building the design the design phase and the more inclusive that is the more successful and candidly effective it's going to be tara would you like to jump in on the um tribal engagement angle that heidi had just mentioned um i think it was covered um, Ari, Roderick, would you like to, do you have anything to add on this topic? No, I, I think she, I think that really covered the a good spectrum. I don't... Great. Um, well, you know, we've been talking a lot. The word trust has come up quite a bit in this conversation. So I really want to acknowledge that we work for many of us, certainly this is true for Ari and Roderick and probably Hadia for you as well. Um, you have, you're going to be faced with 
some structural changes that are going to be needed to prioritize community science. A lot of our institutions are not built for this type of work. Um, and community engaged research looks very different than kind of traditional science, at least that I was trained in. So I'd love to hear if the panelists have any tips that you can share regarding your efforts to make changes that can really make community science and community um, engagement efforts more successful within your institutions. Okay, I will start. I think that was a great summary of what, what you said, Hadia. And I, I feel in the academia, to start the community-based research, I feel there needs more communications. And I think there needs more opportunities for the researchers, students, and um, staff even to be able to be in the community. And that takes a long time. And I think that happens before even thinking about the projects. And then that can come with the project ideation. So I just wonder, is it possible to have more of a, the class going into the community, working together with the community members and doing a lot of outreach? I think that's a great way to really involve the youth. And so how can we enhance that kind of opportunities um, and try to get the silo out um, and the collaboration between government, NGOs, the, the academia and the industry and the communities together. Um, and the tenure process definitely needs to change because that doesn't work in the timeline of the community engagement, but I will stop there. Great, thank you. Uh, Roderick, Hadi, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yes, I think this is a great question because historically our institutions, particularly in the science space, we haven't appreciated how to engage community, how to, engage community insights into what, how we do research, particularly the closer you get to the molecules and, and the digital ones and zeros. And so one of the things, some of the things that we've done is to, at a high level, um, express the, the, the commitment to including the community perspective, including equitable outcomes by senior leadership. That way everyone understands this is something that is valued and, and is desired by senior leaders. But then even more, I would say one of the things that we are, another thing that we're doing is how do we connect community-based engagement or community engagement to the specific interests of the institution and the researcher? Because a lot of times, for example, researchers are connected. They really want relevance. They really want credibility and they want to align with the goals of the institution. And so now when you start to say, well, in order to achieve the relevance that you're looking for, you need to ensure that it's appropriate to all, not only to a very small population. And without engaging communities, you may not understand that that context for the experiment, context for the research design, context for the outcomes that you're proposing is only, only has a small window or a small percentage of applicability. But by engaging communities, you can better understand the broad spectrum of different infrastructures that your solution has to perform in, as well as different um, challenges or constraints. Now you actually can increase the applicability and increase the, uh, um, the outcome percentage to achieve our goals. And then that credibility. A lot of times we think about, is this you know, scientists, when you when you really approach a scientist and it, credibility is core to who we are, you can say, well, if we are not understanding the specific needs of communities, we may be extrapolating by understanding one community and not understanding how it affects another community. The outcome may be extrapolating. And then as a scientist, is that as credible as it could be is because you don't know how your solution will perform and how it will behave. And now you're attacking the very credibility of what we do. And so now that's another way to try to encourage more engagement to say, in order to make your solution more credible to all of the different applications or that you are proposing that it applies, this is a way to ensure that. So those are some of the ways that we've approached it. I'll just, I, I plus one everything that Irene Broderick said. And the, the um, part that I would like to share is if we were to take a step back and think about the actual research team that's being put together to do the research itself, to think about diversity starting from there, to think about who is actually going to be leading this research, who is going to be going into the community. And I, I really emphasize the word going into the community because it, this is kind of, for those that have watched Erin Brockovich or understand what this reference means, will understand very much that showing up in a community, it's, it's about, um, 
it's so much more than about being able to, you know, just show up in, and, and this happened quite a bit, I think, with the U.S. Department of Energy, for instance, they did roadshows. They went into communities all around the country to do listening tours and to, to be able to hear directly from the people themselves. And some of the community-based organizations that had representatives re react and reflect on this experience, it was very interesting. They talked about the fact that by, by design and by law and, and by policy, the Department of Energy is not ex is able to accept things like refreshments or gifts or anything that could resemble such. But in many cultures and many communities, not accepting drink or food is considered to be impolite right and i and i especially in the global context not accepting a cup of tea in many cultures is an affront so i know that this sounds something like maybe perhaps very simplistic but that first moment of being able to build that bridge to build that connection if we are if you're foregoing opportunities to build those bridges that the, the that long road to rehabilitating trust doesn't begin um, the second bit that's related is when I think about a lot of times when I've, I, I've done research projects and I, I for, before I did this work at RMI, I was in charge of a team that was all chemical and mechanical engineers at Columbia University's climate school. And I was the one non-engineer, the one of unicorn in that group. And what was really interesting is that over and over and over, it would be a, a moment of challenging our team to think beyond sort of the parameters of how they were trained to think about something. Um, Sometimes that also requires quite literally having diversity in the team. And so this is a broader, broader structural uh, uh, suggestion. But for those that are in charge of research programs, those that have access to grant funding, those that are department heads, when you're evaluating the pool of candidates that are before you. Think about who we want to be, you know, the people doing this research in the world because they have to be a reflection of the world and certainly a reflection of the communities that we hope to go into. Um, over and over, I've had carbon hydrogen specialist, specialist panels that look nothing like the communities that they're going in to speak with. And then the question comes of like, well, why do you think they don't believe us? It's like, well, because you haven't yet established that you understand what, is, what it's like to live a day in their shoes. And so I will leave it there to say that the more we think about diversity and inclusion in broader senses, um, the more successful we're going to be. Thank you. Well, I'm actually going to transition to questions. So if you're you're ready to go here, sir. I am ready. <laughs> uh, I've, I've got little two pieces of idea and if Tara is still on. Um, and then I've got to ask my tech man, uh, uh, Georgia tech man, a, a question here. Um, so, Hadia, I'm mainly I'm Nathan Mehan, Texas A&M. I'm mainly working in the carbon capture and storage space, and you know, in the capture side, that's usually some industrial facility that that's not much incremental uh, impacts. Our big issues are large numbers of pipelines that would need to be built to scale carbon capture and storage, uh, and some of those have already failed. A lot, um, and then the, a large number of places where we would be storing carbon dioxide at depth, at pressure, underneath people's homes and or at least adjacent to them. Um, most of the jobs are relatively temporary and highly skilled. Uh, there are probably not going to be a lot of big job impacts. Um, I, I'm kind of failing to see much community benefit from what we're doing outside of this grand scheme of decreasing atmospheric CO2 emissions. And so I'd like to get your thoughts on, on you know, how, how we could go beyond backpacks and barbecue, uh, which is kind of the, our DOE get our approval type engagement. Um, and then following up, maybe this is for you, Roderick. Uh, um, right now, the U.S. policies have all been sort of all carrots and no sticks, which means that taxpayers, relatively higher income individuals as a group, have been paying, paying for the carbon capture and storage projects. Ultimately, that's not going to last. That it's going to be reflected in energy prices uh, some way or the other, and consumers are going to get more and more of the burden, which is going to shift the price of carbon capture and storage uh, down the economic ladder. And I wonder what your thoughts are on, on ways to address or mi mitigate that. So, had, had... so this is the... 
you know, this is that million, multi-million dollar question. And we are at the moment, right in this moment, actually looking at these very issues around CO2 pipelines and certainly hydrogen pipelines, because pipelines, no matter like what they're actually carrying, are going to face similar opposition and challenges on the community perspective. So there's a there's a it's sort of two pronged answer, and I just don't even even know if it will fully answer your question because it's it's something that is so deeply nuanced and multifaceted that there isn't really a right answer, and there isn't really a right side to it. But the way that I think about it is that the advice that I give to developers is you have to go where you're wanted which makes it a lot easier to do what you're trying to do. Now that sounds counterintuitive because we know that there's a reason why we want to build the CO2 pipelines where we want to build them because it's just very much about geography and logistics and costs and it just makes sense. This is where we got, we extracted from and this is where we want to sequester. Unfortunately, the legacy and the contextual history of what has happened in the US Gulf Coast, particularly around petrochemical industry, it has been generational to the point now where it's very hard to be able to say, well, how do you repair this damage? The second part of it is, is that carbon as a concept, it's such a, um, almost an esoteric thing to ask somebody to picture gigatons of carbon. If I were just to say right now, what are you all thinking? Can you visualize a gigaton of carbon? I have to visualize many, many gigatons of carbon. It's hard to do that. Hydrogen even worse, so, right? Because it's this tiniest molecule completely invisible to the naked eye. So when we're talking with communities, there's sort of this thing of, does the, does the community want to host this project? The second part is that responsive benefit. There is, there is usually a very clear indicator coming from the community when they feel that the benefits that are being offered are absolutely just not going to be of value. So when I think of Houston, for instance, right now, like after Barrel, we're what now a week out, there's still no power. There's, uh, I think eight or nine, I saw counties with boiling water notices. So wastewater treatment facilities have failed or been breached. So if I, were, if, if I was a developer, I would be thinking, what are the immediate needs of this community? What are the service needs that are of this community that to, for them to survive are not being met? And if my benefits are actually providing that adaptation, providing that first line of resilience, creating livability, guaranteed this might not work in Cancer Alley because their reality is very different. They're literally fighting to try to stay alive. But in certain communities where you have the ability to shore up resilience, you have the ability to make meaningful contributions, that can be bridged. On the workforce front, absolutely, I, I agree with you. I think that if there are temporary jobs where only a few highly skilled workers are going to benefit, and there's no guarantee that there will be first source hiring, meaning that we're going to hire from the community that's right there, because they may not have the skill set, they may not have the abilities to, to fill, fill those jobs, those projects will fail. So this is, it's, it's a very kind of demand supply match thing. It's very, it's not easy to do. And I think that's exactly the issue, right? That we're trying to figure out where is there a good match of what is being proposed to what the communities wish to host. There are communities that have voted yes for carbon capture sequestration projects in the United States. There are states that have been able to successfully do some of these projects. By and large, I think the issue around pipelines is that till we have clear regulatory, clear regulatory jurisdiction, it is defined, it is laid out, because it's not just the issue of building the pipeline. It's like, who is accountable and who's on the hook when, God forbid, something goes wrong? Because the companies will you know, find a way to declare bankruptcy, and who's left holding the bag is the community. So I think that there are bigger sort of structural issues. There are tailored benefits that need to be offered, and it kind of all has to happen at the same time, which is very difficult to do when you're trying to get a project out in like a six or nine month timeline which is very unrealistic in the real world where you have a hurricane season that lasts what several months in the UF Gulf, Gulf Coast so I, I, I apologize that I may not give you the answer or the solution but I hope that it explains that we have structural issues we need to resolve at the federal level we have state level inter and interstate pipeline issues we need to resolve and we need to take a very clear look at the benefits that are being offered because if they're not meaningful if they're not life kind of the life preserving life affirming in many of these communities over and over the answer will be no so i think i'd, I'd like to open up for other questions in the room because of the number of folks that that we have so please if anybody is eager to ask a question don't be shy. 
If not, do we have questions online? Come on. Oh, yeah. Oh, we've got, actually, we've got one here. Um, do we have a microphone to pass over this gentleman? Thank you. Thank you all for very informative and uh, inspiring um, presentations. Uh, I do have a question about the university setting. So this may go to you, Dr. Uh, Sakawa. So um, in terms of the community engagement process in research, what do you see as the key institutional changes that need to happen and what do you see as the incentives? Because I do see faculty like yourself who have a heart for doing community-based work. I see them doing community-based work. But what I don't see is that there's a real institutional set of incentives that would cause a university to reward faculty for doing that other than to publicize it and to uh, reap the benefits of positive press, right? Um, so how is it that we make changes institutionally to get us further along the road? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think about that every day. And I think for climate change in general, we need a change in the university structure because how we work now in these different disciplines just cannot work. And how can we make the different disciplines to come together, not just science, you know, social science, um, medicine and engineering, but I think we need everybody involved. And then I think there is no incentive for that. And so that I, I think we need a new university structure that also allows us to work with the communities more. I think scientists have to be able to connect the dots, not just going for new findings. What are the problems that we all can come together to solve? And that kind of education doesn't seem to be incentivized right now. But I think if we can change the education system from elementary school, have more <laughs> rigorous STEM education and then be more exposed to different disciplines. And then at the university level, how can we collaborate and come together and also work with industry, NGOs and you know, different stakeholders together so that everybody can have a voice? I think that opportunity, hopefully somewhere here, maybe we can start, but it just doesn't seem to be available now. And I don't have an answer for you <laughs> either. Um, I think, I know we have a lot of questions in the room and we're not going to get to all of them. I do want to be able to take one question online. Um, folks, please stick around. You can grab our panelists. Ari and Hadia will be here all day. Uh, but Kamal, do we have a question you'd like to highlight from the virtual crowd? Yes. Um, there are many virtual questions, but because of the, in the interest of time, I'll just uh, reading out one of them. Um, I can read this to Roderick first, um, and then um, if Hadia and Ari wants to um, chime in after. What are some ways to improve trust from organizational perspective in new energy pro uh, projects that have become super politicized? Specifically, for example, in the local area in New Jersey, particularly, there I think there's a new wind farm technology that are being implemented. So if you can just talk about from when, from uh, Roderick, from the leadership perspective, from organizational perspective, what, what are some best practices to start the trust building early on in the energy project specifically? Thank you. I think that's a, a great question. And I want to talk specifically about the New Jersey application, but I'll speak more broadly uh, because I think this is something that is applicable to all clean energy solutions. Is one to not go in, and this is a challenge that we face, is we develop our solution in our labs and then we go in and tell the community, here's what will work for you. Or at best to say, well, I will listen, but I'm going to listen from perspective of how I can help, how my solution will apply in your space. Instead of saying, no, let me go in first and listen with a, and listen with respect to what does the solution need and if and when the outcome is the clean energy solution that we have, then that becomes the, that becomes the answer. But if it's not, we have to have the, the the discipline to say, you know what, what we have developed isn't appropriate here, and we need to go back and make sure that we understand and and, and, and integrate this into our solution, or we say that yes, we could maybe adapt. And that has to be done together. But we really, that trust, it breaks down immediately when we come in and say that we have the solution, we develop without your insight, but just trust me, we know what's best for you. 
Uh, would you like to jump in? I was going to say this question is actually quite perfect because right now I'm actually doing a case study on offshore wind, which is just, it's, it's just a coincidence. And uh, the, the project I'm looking at is of New York, but it's certainly the same issues that we're seeing from New Jersey. So there's sort of the, the interesting the offering that I can, uh, or what I can share is the developer that we're looking at, they have a very interesting perspective. Um, they were able to get the community's buy-in to the point where when they faced challenges with their public utility commission, last year was a very bad year for offshore wind for those that were following. The industry was on the verge of almost being declared like dead because of supply chain issues that happened after the invasion of Ukraine. Um, they came back from that miraculously, but they had members of the community in that tiny Long Island community write to the PUC in favor of the developer, which is like a very unheard of thing because usually there's, if their letters going to the PUC is there to say, stop this project, don't do this project, this project is terrible. And the reason that that happened was that they had done a tremendous groundwork game for a very long time in building that trust. I'm talking like a couple of hundred meetings, talking high double digit public hearings. So none of that, like here's a Zoom hearing, it's going to happen during your lunchtime, or it's going to happen when you're feeding the baby or when you're just taking a shower. So you will not be able to attend, thank you very much, and we're going to proceed. The second piece that I wanted to highlight is that so New Jersey is an interesting case, right? New Jersey's got what the highest Superfund sites in America. I was quite shocked when I found out that, and uh, I think it's um, close to 150 maybe, right? So that's quite a large number. Understanding that the, the, the opposition to certain types of new technologies in certain communities can sometimes also be about trying to understand who's potentially financing the opposition and trying to understand where is the opposition coming from. So where the developers have been successful is where they've been able to do, and I'm quoting the, a representative of this particular project that I've studied. I loved what they said. They said, you, you, you minimize impacts where you can, where you can't minimize you compensate, right? And, and you mitigate where you can. So those are kind of the three things that need to happen. Where project developers have been successful in minimizing, mitigating, and where you cannot mitigate, compensate, they have succeeded. In the case of offshore wind in particular, typically when the offshore cables have to come onshore, there needs to be a massive amount of digging that has to happen, very similar to pipeline issue. There is a sweet spot in terms of what that compensation looks like that has to be worked out with that community. Where they've been able to work out that sweet spot, they have been able to get consent. Um, and so I can't go more into detail I, or don't want this to be a promo for the developer that we're doing the case study <laughs> on, but there is absolutely a case where a, a renewable energy developer reached FID, which is final investment decision, which means that they're proceeding with the project because they did community engagement the right way. Well. I think that's a lovely place for us to stop here. Um, this has been a great panel. Thank you all so much for your time and working with us through all of the people and excitement there is in the room. Please do continue to engage. If we didn't get to your questions, you can come up and find our panelists in the room. I do want to give a special thank you to Allison Kamal and Rose who helped make this panel a reality. Thank you all very much. Um, the New Voices program sponsored and planned this session. I'm really proud of how it came together. Really grateful for our speakers and their time. Please, if you're interested in signing up for the New Voices mailing list, I don't know if we can get the QR code on the screen for our virtual folks, but there's also one on the poster in the front of the room. Um, we're really happy to be able to engage with as many of you as possible and be able to help um, share the word about this wonderful opportunity. Thank you again for your time. I hope you all enjoy your lunch. <laughs>